Edinburgh. It's one o'clock. Welcome to Referendum TV. Yeah. Uh, my name is Pat Kane. That's Leslie Riddick over there. And we are here to conduct a fantastic experiment in public television in the last few days of uh, the independence referendum. On the show today, we have a brilliant list. I'll quickly quick we'll go through them so you know what you're coming up with. Uh, we have Stuart Kirkpatrick, who's head of digital at Yes Scotland. We have Joyce McMullen, we have Labour peer George Fuchs, we have An Angela O'Hagan of the Scottish Women's Budgetary Group, and we have Helen Marney of Lady Tron, a band I have just been introduced to and I'm delighted that I have been done so. So I think the first part of this, as I've been told in terms of the structure, is that we go through the papers, Leslie. Isn't it Correct. sweet? Pat's told. It's not an amazing <laughs> thing Tells, for, a, for a new Tells. man to, to be able to accept. But uh, yes, here we are. We flicked through the papers this morning. Actually, we, we were kind of not tremendously impressed by a lot of the front pages, uh, well, you know, in the sense that they weren't just hugely surprising. Um, the Scotsman has got salmon orders, his party, go out and win. I think he just tells him, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, he probably does. But actually, inside there were some more interesting things we wanted to talk about. Uh, one that Pat had picked up was, uh, there's no point in showing you this, you won't be able to see the headline, but it's English pressing for their own parliament as resentment increases over Scots freebies. That's right, there was an article by um, Tim Montgomery in the Times um, which was kind of saying, you know, yes or no, uh, and he anticipated that uh, UKIP would start to wrap itself in the St George's flag either way. Um, because it's the obvious thing to do. And I think it's one of these interesting things that's sort of emerging, is that no matter what happens with this result, uh, the, the, there's going to be some kind of uh, not, not necessarily harmonious response from the rest of the United Kingdom, particularly England, to whatever happens as a result, as a result of yes-no. Obviously with yes it doesn't matter, but with no it probably does. But I think the fact that you kept picking this up um, is particularly interesting. I have to say, if you read a lot of the... Um, Productions from the new la the Labour think tanks, people like John Crudus and the Policy Review Group, they are as keen to talk about Englishness as they are to talk about Britishness. So it's clearly something that's emerging. The mm. idea that we ha there is an English dimension to a post-referendum politics yeah. is a sort of general topic, rather than it being um, scare quotes one way or the other. I think it's because it, England, as it were, is sort of heaving into view as a sort of political problematic. So I think that's interesting. Yeah, well, I've been, I've been following the campaign for an English parliament, which sometimes has quite sort of sensationalist, slightly neurotic, you know, the mm -hmm. kind of freebies, scroungers kind of line. But the, most of the time, actually, is making some very good points about the distribution of wealth in England. And actually, yesterday, they, were, they had a story they were punting, which was that the uh, councillors around Falmouth the place that might get trident, according to one of the mm -hmm. latest uh, surveys, have all said, no way, we don't want to be sitting, you know, as kind of potential targets ready for a nuclear accident. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's, you know, the, 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 the kind of presumption that a little place in England would just fall into line is already looking like it's fallen a bit off the, the stool. But I think it's quite interesting, you know, a, a, a yes result compels people to think about, compels the rest of the island to think about themselves politically. Mm -hmm. And no result sort of makes it, all those uh, questions about federalism, about local government, pass through the usual way. Minder conduit, so not, not a lot of excitement now, I think, no. for, for um, the English question post yes. There was another one here tucked away, which is, we'll be voting yes, say senior Lib Dem duo. Yeah, now, really here's, this is interesting. I must say, I know uh, Michael Foxley, Dr. Michael Foxley, quite well. He was the uh, head of Highland Council. He was also very involved with the Island of Egg, a huge, huge supporter in the long years of the buyout. Um, also, former MP John Barrett um, have decided that they <laughs> are going to be voting yes. Now, what do you make of that? Well, one of the most dynamic people I remember from the early 90s burst of constitutional uh, activity around about Scotland United and what we were going to do after the 1992 general election was Dennis Sullivan, who actually was a long-standing sort of Lib Dem grandee, but who was fantastic in that moment. I mean, he has a kind of an experience, I think he's an experience in civil rights activism in the 70s, so he come up to you and grab your hand and say, how you doing, brother? It's a, it's a brilliant I think he was a big anti-apartheid. I moment. think he was. So he was a very, very radical person, but a Lib Dem. And it's, it's just such... I know, I know. But, I mean, there's a, I know, but uh, really, but there's something to recover there. And again, it's one of these sort of, you know, glorious possibilities post yes that you can have you say what is my in a sense almost what is the true vocation of my party in Scotland and we, we worry about that in terms of the, the Labour Party but I think the Lib Dems have just as much an opportunity to say do you know what look we're, dem we're locally democratic <coughs> we're anti-centralist we're interested in land issues we have been historically 
let's flourish, blossom in this in this post Indian environment. The only quibble would be why wait for you know for the post independence scenario. It looks like you know increasing numbers of of, of, of fairly prominent figures are coming out having their say. I mean Andy Miles, who was an advisor to yeah. Tavish Scott, has come out for yes. And I suppose because everybody's very dismissive of the Lib Dems these days for all sorts of reasons to do as we know with uh, you know what's happened with of Nick course. Clegg, um, we've perhaps overlooked the importance they have in lots of communities, particularly Highland ones. Well, so I thought that was an interesting yes, one. Now you. You picked out what, a piece that Alison Rowett uh, wrote in the Herald, which yes. was really looking at Ferguson in the States and drawing comparisons with the poor, if you like, in, in Scotland well, and headline, why they haven't rioted. The headline, she says, why, aren't the, why haven't the poor rioted under similarly extreme conditions as we say? Well, not, maybe not in terms of the actual race and police brutality, although that's an argument. But she, she quotes <laughs> a, a report that they quoted a, a couple of days earlier, which unbelievably, and it sort of like slightly sticks in the craw, uh, that the forgotten fifth that people like Stephen Maxwell uh, uh, and, and people on the kind of a, a, a nationalist left in the 70s were analysing as being something that we had to deal with. Forgotten fifth are still here. There's still a fifth of Scots officially and under conditions of regarded as generally categorised as poverty. Now, that's a sort of 30, 40 year problem, which, you know, and there's another, someone, I actually tweeted an image of the uh, the count in 1979, the majority of votes, the 1.2 <coughs> million votes, so the majority of votes. Just imagine counterfactually a world we would be in if there was a Scottish Assembly running through the years of Thatcherism, mm -hmm. as opposed to it not being there. So I think it, it's, certainly for me, it's the moral pulsing core of, of the, the yes argument. You know, is it, there's, there's yeah. a structural problem here and it's, it's, it's outrageous through, uh, through a range of Westminster uh, regimes that we've not been able to address this. That has to be job number one for independence. And, in and she does point out from that report, the poverty and exclusion in the UK study, that uh, not just is that, that, that statistic, one mm. fifth of Scottish children and adults now class poor, although I noticed that some of the headlines picked up only that our percentage was slightly lower than the rest of the UK. This is one of my great beefs because if we're going to make those inter inter you know UK comparisons, we're all lost because we're, we're so adrift from where most northern social democracies are. But they also point out here that 200,000 children are living in damp homes and 30,000 youngsters aren't being fed properly. And that, the thing about the damp homes particularly, is just so shameful because what you keep discovering if you go to the Nordics with much you know, more northerly latitudes is nobody dies of hyperthermia. There's no difference in deaths between the winter and the summer, which is one of the markers. Anyway. And, and anyway, and the model, the model that we build if it, if it works well and addresses these problems, should be an exemplar in any case mm. to the rest of the island anyway. Um, now, I picked up this uh, delightful piece of Daily Mail, my favourite publication. <laughs> it does great biographical profiles, I feel, of 80s pop stars. It really has to be commended. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but anyway, here's another, here's another clause out item from a, a man I have a lot of time for, Alex Bell, who the, the, the Daily Mail has identified to hear. Yes, there's someone here. Uh, has identified as being an SAP insider slating the campaign's deceit. <laughs> um, what basically always having is one of the kind of interesting discussions that we should have about the future shape of a Scottish polity, which is, to, which is in terms of long-term demographics, pension, uh, welfare uh, crises. I mean, the question is, how do we pay for them? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a reasonable question to raise. Um, but we, again, in terms of these media, we can't have them without it being involved in that classic elite framing of splits, divisions, cliques, resentments, etc, etc, etc. I mean, is that, is that, are we just fated for these? I mean, the, the mail is brilliant at this. It takes a serious subject and pours bile all over it and then allows <laughs> us to sort of sit and go, oh, absolutely. Yeah, Forget them all, this you is know. all a bit yucky. Well, the, the, the funny thing was, I think Alex made that speech uh, in the Quaker Meeting House, a, a tremendously Quaker peaceful meeting. place, actually. I'm sure it's the first time the Quaker Meeting House has been, you know, the subject of a large expose in the, in the mail. But um, he was just after a talk that I've been giving. And we, we've all got things to say. You know, it's, mm. it's, a, it's the, the property of all of us to decide how best we might deliver the social democracy many of us have voted for for a long time. So it seems extraordinary that we can't just have that. But yes, I mean, because Alex has been an, an, an insider mm. and because he did leave in some circumstance of being critical of, of the white paper, then I guess everyone's been waiting for the day he said something else that would just allow that one to fester a bit yet. But he's written a book, basically. Mm. Read it. I, I think that would be the fairest way to see what he thinks about life. God forbid we should have intellectually get us in a new spot on that. Would just be, it would be a bit scary. That would just be an appalling state of affairs. But I was actually going to talk, I actually was about to talk about um, 
Gordon Brown's uh, logic splicing essay on why uh, the party that introduced internal markets to uh, the health service was going to defend it against the, um, privatisation in the next uh, after the next general election. But I couldn't be bothered because I saw my old pals, Ricky and Lorraine, <laughs> beaming their beautifully well preserved faces out in support of a yes vote. So I just thought we should maybe just gaze upon that. <laughs> just for a wee while. Beatifically, <laughs> gaze upon their talent, love them dearly, let it go into your brain neuronally. Did anybody see that Mind Games documentary? I didn't, but everybody else did. Part about the psychology of the yes. NDF. Here we go. <laughs> it's working. Are you feeling it? Are you feeling it good? That's quite enough. And we have actually expunged all spiders from the room in case that was to put people Don't off. even say the word spider. Yeah. Some people can't even cope with the word I spiders. That. All right. Uh, there's another word oh, sometimes we're a bit funny about, which actually is, is Newsnight on the telly. And I, I don't know about other people in the audience, but um, I watched Newsnight last oh, night. You didn't get that far. You, you, you kind of switched 20, off 20 allergically. Seconds, Kirsty walked shouting at people, uh, banned in the room. She off. didn't end up shouting at people. Oh. I mean, it was a, f a fabulous contributions, particularly by Tom Devine, who kind of stopped everybody in their tracks after a long list of things that were quite good about the union by say, saying, and sovereignty. <laughs> which rather brought the whole audience up. And Val McDermott, who was talking a lot about the social policies that just warm her up to the idea of an independent Scotland. But it was actually a very fair programme, and Alan Little, again, did an excellent film in it. So I, I thought it was an all-round a tremendous programme. So just because we're always knocking the BBC, I would say that was a good programme. Nice one. Well, as a man who wrote the play Ethic, I'm looking for 10 years of dour Calvinist rationalism in the first 10 years, <laughs> because I just think we need to get to grips with stuff. No I mean all this folder all I, I, and <laughs> gallim offering. <laughs> You need to sit here because we've got a guest. I do realise that. I do just want to tell everyone that um, actually you, you are looking here at a secular Buddhist, just in case Pat doesn't get round to explaining it himself. Secular right. Catholic <laughs> Buddhist. Sorry. <laughs> secular Catholic material is Marxist Buddhist. Um, if. Our, I like, uh, our first guest is a man who has a, had a fantastic job to do, which is to basically run uh, the digital service of uh, Yes Scotland. And I, we're going to have a good conversation with him about how hard you might have thought it was at the beginning, but how easy it's turned out to be at the end. Could you, could you please welcome uh, the head of digital at Yes Scotland, Stuart Kirkpatrick. Well, this is crazy. I should I should know you by sight because we we, we lurked, did we not, around the Scotsman building at much the same time? We certainly did. Was that Hiding the days? from editors. Well, that's <laughs> probably why we never met then. Was this the days where it was kind of so much divvied up into layers that people who were in the active end of the paper never met the people who were just shrieking and pulling their hair out over headlines? <laughs> I think you were in one of the nice wood panelled offices. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you were a rude mechanical. No, it certainly was a very rude mechanical. Uh -huh. But that was a tremendous thing because you, you went on and really, you you made the Scotsman website, when you were involved with it at the start, the best website of any newspaper in the country, didn't you? Um, I, I did, but there are parallels with Yes Scotland in that it wasn't me that made it, it was the, the team around me. And um, uh, yeah, the Scotsman newspaper had a fantastic website for a very long time, thanks to people who now work in other places. Yes, we'll just skate over that aspect Indeed. of it into mm. where you are. Because yes, because uh, you know the, the, the great campaign that's been launched mm. uh, overnight, um, and I was actually at a, a, a Yestival event last night where they were even managing to come up with the statistics, which I'm sure have even been surpassed. So tell us where we are at the moment with it. Um, yes, well, explain because, what it is first. What is Yes Because? Yes Because is a hashtag initiative um, organised by National Collective. And again, it's a tremendous success that's got nothing to do with me. Uh, you need to explain hashtag initiative. Um, <laughs> what, you've given us all that about polymathic Catholic <laughs> Buddhists and you have to explain a hashtag. Come I'm, on, I'm performing a stereotype, but he's here to elucidate. There oh. is a thing called the internet. And there's a thing on the internet <laughs> called social media. I'm so <laughs> the of the internet yeah. now, didn't you? Um, which uh, um, there are various ways of categorising discussions. And a hashtag is like a topic or a channel and um, enables you to make a statement and then put a hashtag, which is a little hash symbol, and some keywords behind it, which then enables other people to find it easily. Yeah. And National Collective um, uh, had a fantastic idea of to mark four weeks to go um, ask people um, around Scotland to put on Twitter and Facebook their reasons for yes because. And um, it took off and it was trending globally, which means it was one of the most talked about things on the planet for a time on Twitter, which is um, an absolutely incredible achievement. But it's, it's utterly stunning because, I mean, every time people went through the, 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 the numbers, the surprise that it was it was tre it was trending in London um, mm. at, at one point raised everyone to think how mechanically does that work? You know, I mean, how was that possible to, to happen? Is that expats, Scots around the world? Is that, you know, how how did that become so successful? 
Uh, it becomes, it's about um, intensity. And it was simply the, uh, the result of hundreds, thousands of people expressing their positive vision for what an independent Scotland means and why they were voting yes. And um, it is a microcosm of how the whole yes movement works online. It was I all sense you're not giving us the secrets of the sort of twiddly bits that you know behind the scenes. Because I mean, surely we feel that we pour our hearts out every day on Twitter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And yet we've never seen a similar sort of wave right across the, the world. So something worked differently with that than, than the other attempts there have been. I'm, I genuinely, um, I don't have a button on my desk that, you know, you know trend globally, click. Um, <laughs> but what we do have is we have um, thousands, tens of thousands of people across the internet, across Scotland, who are expressing themselves passionately. The internet works on the basis of good content and people's co connections and conversations. Um, there is no jiggery-pokery, there is no magic. It's just the vast majority of people online expressing themselves um, in favour of yes. But can I just, before Pat comes in, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing a nudging thing so that we know when we're going to speak. Um, thunderclap is a technique that has been used for some campaigns, so yeah. that it basically times everyone's consents to allow their Twitter followers and so on to be used for one moment when it's released with maximum impact. That's right. Was that used in this one? Nope. It's, it's a bit spammy. And um, everyone ends. Spammy, I feel we'll need to explain that. Um, it comes across as very manufactured. Spam Valley, as I remember from, the, from my 80s uh, uh, private sector housing uh, past. You remember the that. 80s, Pat? It's astonishing. I am the 80s. Keep going. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's right up there with Donald Trump. I am the evidence. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Look, see me really do that. The hair. Believe me, do I not? Scratch me, do I not bleed 80s? Sorry, Stuart. Carry yes, on. yes, right back to that. Thunderclapping, no. Thunder clapping, no. Um, because thunderclapping means that everyone tweets exactly the same thing at the same time, and it yeah. just uh, clogs up everyone's um, Twitter feed. But this was genuinely just people going out and expressing themselves. And it tells you something about the comparative side, size of the two campaigns in terms of having real people doing real things. There's a fantastic uh, mm. short video, six-second video, it's called a Vine, produced by Generation Yes, which showed um, the Yes Because stream against no because which the other side tried to to do as a spoiler and the no because um feed doesn't move at all and then the, the yes because side of the screen screen is just going bang 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 and you know great reason great reason something positive something happy it was just a fantastic illustration of the online campaign and the question i wanted to ask you is we had a conversation about two years ago and almost i'm on the board uh, how will we generate enough digital creativity to fuel this campaign where will we get the, <laughs> where will we get the graphics from the blogs from the memes from? how will we get people to get up and at them it, it's how um, did we manage it Stuart or was it actually that it just happened um, I think uh, there was a lot of um, reaching out to people but frankly it just it just happened yeah. um, and that's the wonderful thing about it it's a little bit like a model of the internet itself in that it's very distributed there's no center there's no command and control there's nodes of creativity firing off. And um, sure, yes, Scotland produces uh, a bunch of content. We focused on our content, and it does very well. But the great thing is th these things happen around us. And whether it's uh, you know, an intelligent analysis from Business of Scotland or something w else wonderful from National Collective or some great videos like Dateline Scotland, it just it happens. And uh, you know, now I have the easiest job in the world. You know, we, we just curate and we help and we push. But this, it's great. It's a fantastic upswell. Well, after you won... Uh, what does it imply for how we do media going forward, whether public media, private media, civic media, whether we donate our time, whether we get paid for our time? I mean, I know we're in the midst of it, but it, it just strikes me way back at the back of my mind. This is, this, this is an amazing but significant precedent for something brand new coming down uh, if we have regulatory powers and institutional powers and budgets. And all that. I mean, have you any thoughts in your head about Absolutely. About that, that are articulable and useful to you. I, yeah. I certainly think that regardless of um, whatever comes in terms of the result, and I obviously I think it will be a win, but regardless, politics has changed forever. And the, the, for, for someone who's <coughs> slaved away in the, kind of, in the corner, in the basement uh, on digital media since 2000, it's a fantastic moment because we suddenly see expose the failings of the mainstream media mm -hmm. as against social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... I think it's incumbent upon all of us who've been involved in the campaign to make sure that things are never the same again, that we take this creativity and we find a model that works to, you know, to keep things going post-referendum.
because there's such fantastic comment out there. And there's, there has been a real flowering politically and in terms of media, in terms of writing and video, um, that we really have to, to keep going so that we tell the stories that reflect what we think about Scotland and that we aren't relying on the Daily Mail's hatchet job anymore. I wonder how, I mean, of course, you know, the great, great question is that how to monetize it, how to organize it. I, I'm trying to think who it was that we had on recently who was talking about uh, d that, using that great Burns quote about, you know, the grasping that the, the flower, the blossom is spread. Mm. You know, the, the, the idea that actually there is all this creativity, but as soon as you try to kind of grasp it, to organize it, mm. to monetize it, to get people to sort of merge forces, then you get all the usual problems that occur mm -hmm. with trying to systematize something that was spontaneous. Yes. So can we manage to, that transition? Because that that's going to be the trick, isn't it? Where lots of us are used to, especially on referendum TV, things being totally voluntary, um, slightly, well, what should we say? Slickly professional. Improvisatory. Slickly professional, improvis imp that word. Um, all those kind of things, which are not really the way that kind of, you know, the, the, the slicker media would like. You can't, you, can't run a, you can't run a living on this kind of way of working permanently. Mm. So how, how can that transition be managed? Have you, have you in your basement figured that out? Um, I was involved in um, an online newspaper called Caledonian Mercury where um, we, we certainly explored lots of ways of not making any money out of journalism <laughs> online. Um, I, believe I, I believe I joined you in that. I you <laughs> um, the other thing that is very interesting about what's happened has been um, the rise of crowdfunding during this mm -hmm. for projects, uh, left, right and centre. Some have been fantastic, some have been fanciful, but there's a real appetite for people to back the things they think are important. And that is the seed somewhere in there for mm. how we go forward and how we fund things. I am by trade a journalist. I don't believe in working for nothing. Um, and uh, if we want the media we want, then we need to back it financially and to purchase the product or to donate or whatever. And I think there is a willingness being demonstrated among people to back projects that they believe in that they feel have validity. Mm. And I think that, and I think, and I remember when Wings, just to briefly, we're about to move on, but just when Wings Scotland said, 50 pounds buys you six months of the daily record. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that, that hypothecation is maybe the way that we go. Anyway, could you please, this man has a lot of work to do in the next four weeks, could you please give him a supporting, <laughs> life-enhancing cheer <laughs> to Scott, Stuart Kilpatrick of the... <laughs> <Thank you very laughs> well. No, I'm uh, delighted to uh, introduce uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, probably too good a friend of mine. If anybody's watching this and wants to see the lefty, squashy, liberal progressive elite gathered in one room and instantly neutron bombable, here we all are. Well, we have got George Fawkes to come, so you know we have got some hope. I That's think, true. We have we have some we have some roughage. Yes, have some roughage we have in got the, roughage in the, in the, the fruit mix. in the fruit compo. <laughs> Uh, that is referendum TV, but uh, who am I talking about? It's obviously who I'm talking about. It's the doyen of uh, theatre criticism. It's uh, a constitutional um, adventurer and uh, cutting-edge thinker. Could you please welcome Joyce McMillan? Hello. What's your Joyce? Immediate scrutiny of Joyce's badge for appropriate political symbolism, and there's None. none. I'm, I'm making up for that, actually. I've got my uh, no, new eye badge. It's a little brooch. It's actually got a slight Macintosh thing, so I suppose it's, a, it's a little nod to Scottish culture. You're not culture. a badge woman, then? You no, I'm not a badge woman. I actually don't like badges. I wear them on very rare occasions. Might wear one on September the 18th. Okay, okay. And I'm going to ask you what it is, but I hope it's the one I hope it is. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, here we are in the midst of the Edinburgh Festival, which I always find overwhelming. It's just this... You know, it's, cataclysm, it's, it's metacosm of culture, whatever you want to call it, it's yeah. just like too big but for a Ouija. Too big for a Ouija, or, or, <laughs> or sometimes just too much for a human being. Yeah, it is too much for a human being. But um, to, to ask you just generally your overview, your sense of where uh, the constitutional debate has impacted, uh, whether the shadow has fallen over it, whether it's lit it from underneath, just in a sense of. of of not, not just a balance between yes and no, but just how it's affected people's sensibilities, mindsets, aesthetics as they've come in 
to this event? What's your general gestalt kind of feel about it? Um, well, I mean, the Edinburgh Festival isn't primarily about Scotland. It is an mm. international festival, and that's true of the festival and the Fringe. And even if there was a higher Scottish content in the international festival, which a lot of people have argued for, you know, it still would be, we, one would hope, the kind of glorious international yeah. thing that it is at the moment. Yeah. So yeah. I would say, yeah. certainly on the Fringe, most of the, the people who are performing on the Fringe are barely thinking about the referendum at all, if, mm. they, if they've even heard of it because they come mm. from you know I mean last night we had our big Scotsman Fringe Awards and we were awarding shows from Ireland from China from you know I mean the, 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 there are people whose whose problems and whose um, issues are just so much uh, more urgent and the Chinese show in particular is very very moving it's just like a, a series of little short stories about ordinary lives in China now mm. and how they're being shaped by this mass migration um, from the country to the city stuff like that so you know even if you're only looking at the serious side of the Fringe there are people with loads of things on their minds which are nothing to do with Scotland. Um, there have been shows that have touched on the referendum. I haven't seen all of them. Um, I saw a couple of the ones that are at Tommy Shepherd's assembly rooms, which has been publicly accused of being totally taken over by the, the Yes campaign because it's got eight shows out of 75 which um, touch um, on the referendum. I mean, you do certainly, uh, both from cringing Scots and from others, get this thing in Edinburgh that being Scottish is being parochial, whereas being any other nationality is jolly nice and interesting. So you know it's um, it's um, it's irritating, and I, I you know I personally feel quite grateful to Tommy for giving a platform to some of the work around the referendum. He's staging mm. Alan Bissett's The Pure, the Dead, and the Brilliant, um, for instance, well but yeah. very well received. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's not great drama, and I don't think Alan would claim that it is himself. It's a kind mm. of extended sketch for mm. this moment of kind of referendum decision, and it's very very funny, um, and it works really well with 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 the audience there, and it's very very well performed by a cast led by the wonderful Elaine C. Smith. So it's, you know, it's interesting to see that kind of stuff being done. There's also a couple of pl plays about the strange death of Willie McCrae. Mm -hmm. Although, interestingly, I felt that both of them in different ways, one of them is by George Gunn um, and the other um, is, is at the suite in, in, in the grass market by Andy Patterson. And, and I felt both of them struggled in different ways with the fact that this mm -hmm. is a very different time yes, from exactly. the time when Willie McCrae well, died. Um, and, and when a man like moment, Willie oh, McCrae yeah, could yeah, stand yeah. for the leadership of the Scottish National Party and it was there was a, a kind of mystical edge to it, a lot of culture, a lot of mm. poetry, and, and I mean it's interesting. Yeah, but this is you know the, the Scottish national movement now is so different from that that I thought both of those plays struggled with that a bit. What, what mm. about the James plays? I mean, ah, you wouldn't, yes, you wouldn't immediately <laughs> know which way that would be going in terms no. of any kind of input. To Explain the just a bit. Debate. I mean, I, I haven't. I'm sure that George will. Have you seen them all, Leslie? Or just no, a... I missed the first. Right. Okay. So well, what are the James plays? The James plays are an absolutely huge problem. And they're absolutely typical of the outgoing now now leaving. Um, director of the Edinburgh International Festival, Jonathan Mills, who's Australian. Jonathan said that he just wasn't going to have anything to do with the referendum. It caused a great stushy because of that, because he said know. he was going to have stuff to do with the Commonwealth, he was going to have stuff to do with the First World War, but he wasn't going to have anything to do with the referendum. So then he turns around in typical Jonathan style and co-commissions, along with um, the National Theatre of Scotland and the National Theatre in London, and that's the first time they've ever worked together, um, um, a huge trilogy of history plays about Scottish history from the Scottish playwright Rona Munro. Um, and so these deal with the first three James Kings, um, um, James I, James II, James III. Um, and it's a very little known part. I mean, I, you know, I consider myself reasonably, you know, compared with, 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 with what some people have to put up with now at school, I got quite some education in them um, in Scottish history, but I knew very little about these three, um, these three kings. And it, it's, it's extremely interesting to see that kind of period of history brought to life. And it's particularly interesting if, like you me, you've had a life immersed in Shakespeare, because they, they, they actually the Henry the Fourth plays of Shakespeare are set at exactly the same period in England. This period of kind of nation building, of trying to bring nations from this kind of tribal conglomeration into something more like a modern state, where people would pay taxes and pay for defence and so on and all the rest of it. Um, and and the, the the very very difficult role of kings basically in that in that process, you know, Can trying to embody this without being you know without just turning into a complete murdering thug, which some of them did, of course. Yeah. Obviously, what we do with Shakespeare mm. and what we do with the history plays is we yeah. pull it this way and that way according to contemporary situations, That's contemporary right. politics. Yeah. But is this an example of actually setting up the narrative in the first place? Yes. I yeah. mean, it's, a, it's a, an absolutely mind-blowingly ambitious project. Mm. I mean, they've set up this whole narrative, three two-and-a-half-hour plays, and the production is huge. I mean, it's so exciting, isn't it, Leslie? When you go into the festival theatre, and not only is the whole theatre full, which is 
1,500 seats at least in the festival theatre, depending on how it's configured. But there's also another 200 seats around the back of the stage, high up. So it feels like a kind of arena. Which actually echoes the point yeah. you're making about it's feeling like a Shakespearean yes. globe type yes. experience, yes. that yes. you're almost looking back into something that but has been in our... You know, in, in the genre right. for quite a long That's time, right. except that it yeah. was written just very recently. Yeah. But the third one now, the third <laughs> one seems to end with kind of messages potentially about the referendum, I thought. But then I wondered, you know, is that yeah. just the way I've been looking but at it? And I'm not trying to spoil it for anyone who hasn't yet seen it, but the last one is tonight. Well, what did you think the message was? Don't give the end. Well, it seemed, there seemed to be a very a great speech by Margaret, uh, which played by Sophie Grable, who was absolutely phenomenal. She was as, fantastic. The woman from The Killing, wonderful. Yes, uh, and, and Stunning again, performance. speaks actually to the way that a lot yeah. of the Nordic actors have, have been so good in these yeah. kind of TV series, because they're actually stage actors first yes. and foremost. Mm -hmm. yes, but it seemed, she seemed to be saying, don't fear the future, yes. know who you are, walk forward. Forward. Yes. And at yes. that point, the final I, the I, final James walks through into a big yeah. bang and a kind of flash yeah. of light. Yeah. No, there was definitely there was a speech near the end, both from her and from another character about we can't know the future anyway, so let's go for it kind of thing. But what what we're being invited to go for, I don't know. Actually, I thought it, there were different messages coming explicitly and subliminally. Explicitly, I think you could read it like that. Subliminally, I thought a lot of the humour and a lot of the way it was playing with the audience's assumptions about being Scottish were actually quite old-fashioned. There was an awful lot of jokery about how Scotland's wee and poor and cold and doesn't have any apples. And, at the, and in that very final scene, before she says, go for the future or whatever, um, um, the, the Queen says, Scotland is a country with fuck all except attitude. <laughs> and again, it's a big laugh it because it's, it's a brilliantly well turned <laughs> line. But is it has it ever been true? Of course That's not. Kind of Irvin Scotland's, Welsh. That's kind of Irvin yeah, Welsh I mean trope, Scotland's it, you know? always had so much yeah, more than attitude. Although you could be saying she's acting the part of a character who has who's come from, <laughs> from Denmark, Denmark. Yeah. you know, who is who is trying to posit the sense, and it plays also to her own reality <laughs> as an actor. She has come from of Denmark, which you might now know yes. has got some higher <laughs> perhaps standards and sort of all sorts of things true. than us. Um, but I yeah. think it, it, yes, it was it was a huge laugh at that point yeah. but she also said I sometimes don't like Scotland I love it yeah. Now I think mm -hmm. again that sort of got a bit of a. I do you know I think this put this points but where you don't need to say this stuff, Leslie. But I'm afraid I got very bored with all these generalisations a good thirty years ago. I, I you know, <laughs> I mean <laughs> people could say that this. you could say that about England, you could say it about Denmark, you could say it about America. You know, I don't like it, but I love. It's, it's what everybody feels about the place that they come from sometimes. Mm. You know, and and this kind of I call it neurotic particularism. The idea that because something's happening in Scotland, it means it's only happening no, in no, Scotland. No, no. I'll beat, I'll so only, <laughs> only, only nations that have been in a weird kind of subject position yeah. have that kind of neurosis that yeah. they're the only place where it ever rains or whatever. Well, you just, know. just to conclude this, I would like to say we're probably both adherents of the creed, the furious, spittle-flecked creed of Scottish normalism. Yeah, Are we Scottish we're normalists? Normal. We're the normalists. Could you please cheer number one Scottish <laughs> normalist, <laughs> Joyce McMillan. <laughs> And Leslie has the fantastic privilege of... Introducing George Fawkes. I don't think I can do any more than that than say, bring Lord George, George on. Lord in. <laughs> Hello, George. Hi, hey, George. How are you doing? How are you doing? Well, welcome to our cosy uh, blue <laughs> Beer chair. pit, sorry. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for that warm welcome, by the way. Very <laughs> generous of you. I, I feel like Daniel. Do, well, not at don't, all. don't. But you, you wanted to come on actually and talk about federalism. I did, and yes. you still do. Yeah, very much so. Why? Because you haven't talked about it much up till now, have you? Oh yes, I have. Right, I apologise. On you go. No, no. I, this, was, this is what worries me, uh, Leslie. You write a lot. I wonder sometimes if you read what other people write. For the last five years, I've been writing articles in Labour List and Progress and a whole lot of other things about a federal United Kingdom. And now more and more people are coming round to that point of view. Gordon Brown, I'm glad to say, uh, Ming Campbell, the Liberals are endorsing it. The Liberals are coming again. Round. They're, no, they're coming back to it. They're well, coming quite. back to it. <laughs> uh, but they went they went off it for a while. Now they're coming back to it. And I mean, I think it's the right thing. You see, you, uh, Pat, and I agree on the kind of country we want. We agree. generally, I think. Yeah, we want. To, yeah, we do. We want to get rid of food banks. We want to get. Uh, you were talking about damp houses earlier. We want the poverty to be George, eliminated. George, we want to get rid of the House of Lords. Yes, so do I. 
<laughs> you see, that's, that's a funny way of doing it. That's the other thing you haven't read, Leslie. I've actually, I'm one of the authors, there are eight of us, who've produced a, a, a plan to replace the House of Lords. Have you seen it? By Have you read it? I'm more on a by their actions you shall know them sort of thing. So no, it's no, just no, the no, puzzle no. that you're in there is the thing, you know. But uh, this is fifth columnist. You get in to get to get rid oh, of it. Oh, that old one, right. No, okay, no, no, no. Uh, anyway, but, tell me you're thinking about the House of Lords. Well, then. I'll tell you about it. We've, we've produced a report which says that there are two phases of replacing the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. First of all, we need immediate things. People think I go around wearing an ermine robe all the time, for God's sake. Do you I don't. I, I don't think we should wear it ever. No, and the, the report suggests that we should get rid of that. The report suggests that immediately we should do something about getting peers to retire at a certain age, that we should uh, uh, have a, a, an attendance, uh, an arrangement that you have to go for three days out of the five, uh, and a whole range of things like that. But then in the longer term, to find a way of replacing it by a different second chamber. Now, this is the question that we've put forward. Do you have a second directly elected chamber which challenges the primacy of the commons, or do you have something different? And we've suggested that we look at ways of having something different. George. And I'm in, just, well, wait a minute. Say, do you just say that one phrase in all of that that yeah. just makes my heart sink is, look at ways to. You know, you well, what and do you I, do it? But, no. What else you, do you no, do? What else do you, you do? you and I are old enough to have known that we've been looking at things we haven't no, tackled no, we for have. decades. We've got rid so of So why are we looking at this again? Because well, we've, you, we've all been talking about this for 40 years, yeah, haven't we, we? And we've got rid of hereditary, right? Yes. That's the first thing. And last, thing. And last amazing, week, we got 22 so, yeah. new peers, 17 of whom were poli politicians. Absolutely disgraceful. Seven, mi seven million absolutely, contributions to Absolutely parties. disgraceful. So why, so why any optimism what, that we're getting second, any closer to change? Right, the second thing the Labour government did, after we created the Scottish Parliament, and don't forget that, a very important thing we did. The second thing we did uh, in terms of, of uh, constitution was to get rid of the hereditaries in the House of Lords. Now, I would have liked to have gone further. And what we're planning now is to go further. That we, that we need, first of all, you, do you need a second chamber? And then if you do... Why did you not get on with it when you had the chance? I think that's what everybody mm, would feel. Mm. What is the difficulty that allow, means that you need to have these two-stage approaches instead of when you have the will and you have support from the Lib Dems that you mentioned, why not be able to horse well, on and make the wholesale change? Because you have to decide what the replacement is going to be. Now, if you listen to what I was going to say, do you have a directly elected second chamber challenging the primacy of the House of Commons? Then you get this constitutional, uh, uh, as they have in the United States, this gridlock because you have two elected chambers. So what do you do? You, you think about, do you want a second chamber? If you do, should it be a, a, something that is questioning and challenging the, the first, the, 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 the elected chamber? And I'm in favor of something like the, the French system, which is indirect election, where they have grand electeurs. And that's what I've been proposing, is that they ha we have a system where the second chamber is representative of the regions and nations of the United Kingdom. And that, that, uh, that's why it relates to what we're talking about in terms of the constitutional change, because that we would be part of it. But George, can I ask you, I mean, um, I have a few, you know, SNP friends uh, down in, in Westminster, and they take me, I think Angus Robertson will often take me around, uh, just once or twice, been around, just, and the sense that any kind of futuristic or 21st century change can come out of that environment, my sense that environment is that it's tired, um, it's it, it's proximate to a city of London, which which increasingly sort of calls the shots overall. So sort of, I mean, I think the question of lobbyists, of of of, of ministers, not just Labour ministers, other ministers, yeah. disappearing from office and then immediately going on to the boards of industries, cognate to the things that they were involved in. I mean, the and when you go to the Scottish Parliament, you go to the Holyrood Parliament, there is a sense of newness, there is a sense of progress. I mean, I mean, I I'm I'm I'm, I'm anticipating a yes. But I'm, I'm, I'm seriously asking you, I mean, I, I think you've had a chance yeah, to talk yeah. about your federalism. And I say this to a lot of people who are on the quote-unquote unionist side. Do you have any uh, um, energy, spirit, imagination for what you might do yeah. as a dyed-in-the-wool political for an independent Scotland in the context of an independent Scotland? And I say this I mean, to you I, as I, a democratic socialist question, talking Pat. to a <laughs> social democrat. You know. Pat actually... Uh, tweeted that he was bereft of any questions and and solicited them on Twitter. But that's a, that's a good one. No, I mean I, I think you're right. I say no to separation, 
But I also say no to the status quo. I want things to change. I want, I, I mean, there are a lot of us in Westminster who want to uh, change. There are a lot of us in the Labour Party who want but things to change. We government for so <coughs> and we, many and we years. And we did, we set up a Scottish Parliament. All these we, issues, we changed a whole range of things. We, we brought in a national minimum wage. We did a whole, yeah. we could have done more, of course, Leslie. You, you could have joined us and we could have done more. No, but but we you're, did, facing, you're, you're, face, you're face a kind of crisis of England which I think is what UKIP actually is, is an expression of the crisis of where are we in the world, what are we doing? Um, you know, you, 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 sort of, you, you face a kind of an exhausted sort of political process. No, and, I do, and I do ask you, if you look at the energy that's coming through the yes side, is there no part of you that thinks, you know, I want to be part of a, a force of change and I want to be part of something that will actually get the popular will and the popular consensus yeah. rather than deal with the marginals to make new institutions, to you, do I mean, real reform. You sound like um, my good friend Ken Stott, who was, I was having a drink with the other day, who said, George, you could be famous. You could be the first Labour peer to support the Yes campaign. You see... You're not being people but with Pat, stains now, Pat, you? Pat, it, you know, of course it's tempting. You know, you, I'd get huge publicity. George I, I would be tempting. I would, I, 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 I would be front page of, of every newspaper in uh, uh, Scotland. But it's, but it's wrong if you don't believe it. And I believe that, I believe that the people of, of England who are suffering are just as important as the people of Scotland. And I want to see change throughout the whole of the United Kingdom. Where can it start, though, George? Well, if it has to start, it's the obvious place I, for it to I mean, start on these you know, islands. I got like, on the 18th of I was in the Scottish Parliament for four years. Yes, I like you the, remember you well. I like the Scottish Parliament, and I, I was, I was trying to get some change in the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament is not the acme of democracy. I mean, I the, the it's what's a no compared to West well, well, I mean, I don't. George, how can you? For let example, me just tell you. Let me just. How can you get yeah. to a stage where first yeah. past the post, for example? It's something that now we're stuck with for probably no. another Mr. 10 Fuchs, years. Mr. Fuchs, this is your last shot. You've got a minute. You can call me George. <laughs> <laughs> the central, the, the, the centralisation in, in Scotland has been terrible. To bring in one police force, that's forgetting the importance of the differences within Scotland. The northeast of Scotland, where I was brought up, is very different from Glasgow, where you were brought up. It's completely different. And yet, this centralisation is taking place. Also, we've got one... A parliament, one, one chamber, dominated by one party, dominated by one man. And people are getting more and more worried about what Scotland might be like if it was the same, if it was just one chamber of one parliament dominated by one you man. You are the man that said dictator, but... you know. No, I never did. I never did. Oh, no, you're to be wearing the ermine. Anyway, listen. I may have made up the word please, cybernet, please, but I didn't... Please, <laughs> once we get over the, the hurry event horizon, once we get a yes, come up and bring your energies to this place. I respectfully request Lord Fuchs. You would like um, me to start stand for an independent Scottish Parliament? Absolutely. No, you don't need to. But the other thing is, George, the thing we've learnt here is you can have a lot of power out with political structures. I've just been appointed a trustee of Age Scotland. I, I used to work now for Age Concern. Now you're preparing around. He's preparing uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and now, now uh, the director said to me, George, now you've got a vested interest in come in and, and, and help us. And I'm doing that. Come Ben the house. Could right. you please cheer a very brave... <laughs> and redoubtable <laughs> Lord Fuchs, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, not many now, chunks of flesh there. I thought well, that was that's all right. It's all been extraordinarily oh, reasonable, um, and and doubtless there will be many who say we could have a part two of that one as well. But um, let's possibly. let's move on. Uh, we've now going to introduce um, Angela O'Hagan. Um, who is of the Scottish Women's Budgetary Group. So can we please have a large cheer for Angela? <laughs> now, uh, actually, you were the one that had, had read this in some great detail, the I Women's bet. Budgetary Group well, report, I mean, and I've got a thought Women about of an Oxfam Independent Mind is a great title from, from the get-go. Uh, and obviously, I mean, I'm part of the, the Reed Foundation uh, and Commonweal, so obviously Ilsa... You worked with Ilsa Mackay, I think, yes, is that right? Yes, my very good friend, Ilsa. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, we should much explain lamented, that much died, lamented, sadly. Um, much lamented. Earlier this year. But, yes. um, I mean, I was sort of looking, at, there's a sort of six-point plan at the end, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I mean, certainly some of, the, some of the things that you're sort of citing, um, it's almost like, it's, I mean, it feels like an alternative, almost socioeconomic programme, and it's an interesting thing. Do you want it to be something, I mean, is there any way that... Um, 
you know, you would have a women's party. I understand there are some p- parts of the world that actually have women's parties. You know, is, does it require that, or do you, or do you actually think you should just be pushing? You're, you're knocking at the door of existing political actors because obviously that's what Ailsa did with her counsel to the Scottish government in terms of bringing in childcare. So is that the thing? Does it is it is it kind of pressure, pressure, pressure upon the existing actors, or does it need something just a wee bit, a wee bit more? Um, like women for women for independence, for example, is that what happens to them after the event? Do they take up a program like this and go forward with it? What do you think? Um, which which of the questions will I start oh. with first? <laughs> I mean, you're talking about badges. I mean, this morning coming out, I was rummaging for my fifty fifty badge um, oh, from the, the previous campaign and the devolution campaign. And I think at that time there was talk of a women's party. Um, <coughs> and I suppose firstly I should explain the paper. Um, that you're talking about, um, women of women of independent mind. I wrote for the Commonweal, mm. not as the Scottish Women's Budget Group. And the Scottish Women's Budget Group are a group of women from across Scotland, all Erts and Perts and perspectives, and perspectives on the referendum question as well. But what we do, consistent <coughs> with what this paper does, is try to get underneath the institutions, get underneath the main areas of public policy that are always talked about but are never talked about as women's issues because women's mm-hmm. issues are, are somehow or other something separate mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. taxation, welfare, social mm-hmm. protection, social housing that you've mentioned, Leslie. And so what we try to do in this paper was to say where institutions, where systems are not working for women and to say that the status quo is not acceptable for women. The status quo where women experience the levels of violence that they do, the levels of, of low pay and unequal pay and so on and so on. We know the statistics, we know how underrepresented women are and how overrepresented men are <coughs> across the media and across <coughs> politics. So changing that means changing the institutions, it means taking back some of that power and crucially it means having women involved in the constitution building of Scotland, mm. having women round the table. One of the Ailsa's Eels, phrases was always, "If you're if you're not at the table, you're on the menu." Um, mm. And mm. so, making sure women are both, I think, you know, we we're on the list, um, you know, mm. the to do list, if you like, to sort out women's representation, to sort out um, the the economic conditions in which women are living in Scotland, and women being part of making those decisions is really the only way that that will happen. Whether we do that through parties or not, there's lots of talk of of other parties, but what absolutely I think has to happen is that the the parties who dominate the discussion just now have to take much a much closer look at what they're saying and what that means for women and they're not doing that you know the 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 devolution commission from scottish labor makes 10 references to women mm. most of them about women on boards there's no mention they don't talk about violence they talk about when they talk about equal pay in passing they talk about um, bringing enforcement of the equalities legislation, devolving that. Well, what about the content of that legislation? Um, a creaking Equal Pay Act that continues to fail women across many Labour-dominated, Labour-run councils in Scotland who still haven't had equal pay cases resolved over the last 10 years. The, the, the White Paper has some good ideas. One of them is the childcare idea as advanced by, by Ilse Mackay through the National Council of Economic Advisers. And I think the crucial thing about the childcare um, proposals in the white paper, which was kind of lost in the yaboo between the parties, mm-hmm. was it talks about transforming childcare, that it's not a women's issue, it's a common I good. I to ask you about this because, I mean, OK, I, I think there's clearly um, a requirement for, um, you know, not quotas, but just looking at the actual 50 50 of everything. I mean, the Commonweal, the new board, the Commonweal is strictly 50 50 in terms of the people that are on it. But, uh, I mean, the thing about nurturance, nurturance is a word that's in my head as much as anything else, which men can get involved in. And if you, in a sense, it's just, tell me whether you think this is a strategic question, because if the men are in power, but the work, workaholism, presenteeism, is something that maybe can be appealed to them and saying, do you want to live a sort of slightly gentler, more sociable life? I mean, is, is parenting a discussion that is as important a word in this as women's issues? I mean, is there a way to sort of get to men to say, look, there's a way that you can come off the accelerator here and there are women ready to join you in the process of making us a somewhat more humane society? But I just wonder whether there's a, there's a, there's a bit of... Ret- I don't, or is this something that we get to at some point? I think we have to get to it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and the phrase I use in this paper is, is maybe a bit academic in that I talk about recasting gender relations, but if I understand you correctly, that's kind of well, what we're meeting, it, what we're meaning. Together, you know, yeah. that women and men don't have to occupy the spaces that we have been allocated yeah. over the generations, over the centuries. Women and men can and 
and should equally share roles in parenting, in caring. In the paper I talk about a caring economy, yeah. one that, that values care and who provides care. Because one of the fundamental problems around these roles is that care is consistently undervalued. Why is that? Because care is consistently provided by women in the majority and women are undervalued in the labour market and undervalued economically and undervalued socially then if we tie it into women's into the violence that women experience. Sure. So by recasting those gender relations to say women and men have an equal expectation yes. um, and we should make those expectations of men so that it's not women. I mean, yesterday in advance of the launch talking to colleagues, listening yet again to stories about women whose summer holidays were or whose summer period has been pulling their hair out trying to balance childcare because their employers are saying, no, you can't possibly have time off, and asking, well, are their partners and husbands and, f and fathers of their children having those same um, discussions in their workplace? But for it's really to do with political economy and, and the labour market. I mean, I am a freelance, cultural freelance, and I know a lot of men, a lot of men around about me, who are, can't, would not want to move into uh, a permanent position, a staff position, a presenteeist position, because actually it allows them that level of flexibility sure. to do childcare, to do community yeah. care, to look after older parents. Well, so on a, that, I mean, we know. talk in the paper, um, and I, I, there's a quote in it from the Women's Enterprise Framework launched earlier mm. this year, that if, if women's women-led business, so women as self-employed um, or small business owners, um, were to if, if we were to increase the level to the current level of, of male-led businesses, is it, is then the there gap? would be a big, it would move from 7.6 to 13 billion mm. Um, mm. if we, but mm. there needs to be some fundamental and some very practical changes there. Childcare is you can't offset childcare against your tax if you're a self-employed mm. person so that mm. affects women and men but mm. women in the majority. So you know, these kinds of, of structural changes are within our grasp, within independence. In terms of why do we want independence, what difference will it make for women? If it's not going to make a difference for women, then why would we bother, I would say. It has to make a difference for women. And it has to... Just a couple sure. of years of no, no. delight, actually, to sit in a conversation about you know women's issues and feminism and such. <laughs> and not, not, no, but it's fabulous. I thought I'd give you a rest. It's, it's the moment when you don't actually have to kind of keep pushing it along that you realise something good's really happening in life. Um, I was wondering if you, you looked at um, Oxfam's suggestions yesterday. Catherine Trebek had mm -hmm. written an article looking beyond GD as a yeah. measure of mm -hmm. worth and yeah. value. Mm -hmm. And I was picking up yeah. some of the things you were talking mm -hmm. there because, you know, violence, you can't kind of measure that on GDP. Yeah. We've got ludicrous aspects where producing more weapons increases Absolutely. GDP. More ill people creates more higher GDP. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to look at something that's more sort of involved with people, you know, yeah. to try and establish their own measures mm -hmm. of what really makes a better life. Mm -hmm. um, have you got thoughts on that as a, as a, as a wee way, perhaps, for the Scots to move forward? Absolutely. And Catherine, through Oxfam, advanced the Human Kind Index as an alternative to measuring GDP, as a, an alternative always almost to, to measuring how we manage that misery and, and, the, and, and what we count. And what we count by way of, of what matters. And so, you know, if we don't value care, then we're not counting care. We're not counting that unpaid contribution to the economy, that whole provisioning that Carol um, Bateman talks about or, or Diane Elson. You know, who's supporting the workers, um, assuming that we still have some workers? Um, and what do we value uh, and, and where should we allocate our resources? So into well-being, into social investment across the life cycle that supports people when they're having children, supports people when they are ill, supports mm. people when their own access to employment, access to enjoying a full range of life in society. We've had a really great discussion today about culture. So enjoying all those aspects is valued, is resourced and is structured in such a way that individuals, regardless of their sex, regardless of their gendered roles, um, can access um, in equal measure. And so Measuring GDP is, is something that we talk about in the paper for, mm -hmm. for Commonweal and to move away from that and to move to thinking around well-being. And why is it that the recovery, we're hearing about the recovery from recession, who's it working for and who's it not working for? And if we looked at what matters a bit more, then we would maybe know where to put our resources and that's hopefully what we can do. Well, just to wrap it up, but I mean, I, I've, I've always wanted uh, the Scottish National Anthem to be is there for honest poverty. Uh -huh. But there is, a, there is a lyric problem with it, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. um, which your report, Women of Independent Mind, Commonweal com com points out. But I think absolutely fascinating. Could you please give it up for it? Uh, Angela Hagan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd still be voting for Hamish Anderson's Freedom Come All You Myself. Totally. A rave version. <laughs>
Yeah, which, which you will which you will finish today's program with. Is, uh, maybe, maybe I, maybe I think that's a test of being a Scots lefty, which I've just failed. Right. Okay. Well, th this is a, this is a huge program for you, as well as admitting that you, you know you're big, every, every you're big time I appear on camera, it's a revelation <laughs> either for the people or for me. <laughs> right. So but let's anyway. move, let's move uh, seamlessly onwards with a woman who knows no uh, failure in her life because it's all been <laughs> just one great burgeoning piece of success. At yes. least that's uh, how we can perceive it from afar. Helen Marney is here to tell us if it's that way or different. Please welcome from the Lady Tron. From Lady Tron, Helen Marney. Oh, now you're a Scottish lass. You're from Glasgow I itself. Am, yes. Well, I grew up in Mulgay, so it's kind right. of a suburb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. I was sort of grew up in Bear's Den. Oh. <laughs> so, um, so there you are. You're in Mulgay. Things uh, kind of maybe not quite as hot as you like. So you find yourself travelling down south. You spent quite a long time, 14 years in England. Yes, I went to university in Liverpool, so I was there for four years. Did my course, stayed an extra year. And then, yes, I ended up going south to London, uh -huh. and I was there for 13 years. Yeah, but you're back up the road. Yes, I, I always wanted to come back to Scotland. I just had this thing inside me, like, kind of, like, drawing me back, and I've been up for about two years now, uh -huh. and I'm in Glasgow. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and you, you and the band Lady Tron, you know, we're... we're you know, it's a moment where we realised that we've just been kind of getting on a wee bit, actually, Pat, earlier, because we realised we didn't realise. You've had five studio albums. Yes. You're massive, basically. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're quite big in some places, yes. Where are you, where are you big? Where are you we big? do quite well in America and South America. Okay. Um, and your style yeah. of music? It's like electro-pop. I was listening to it last night. It's fabulous. Yeah. Well, you've been described by Brian Eno as the best of English pop. Now, this perhaps yeah. brings us to oh, a certain yes. sort of question. <laughs> I always had a problem with that, if I'm honest, <laughs> yes. But it was because we started in Liverpool. So everyone uh, just assumed we were a Liverpool band, even though, uh, well, the two guys are from Liverpool, but I was from uh, Glasgow and the other girl was from London, although via Bulgaria, so... Yeah, um, we are from all over the place. Uh -huh. yes. And one of the things that I mean, you, you're somebody who's I think I'm right in saying you've decided that you're voting yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh, like, yes. That oh, wasn't yes. even a decision. That was Very just good. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you've got some thoughts, actually, interesting thoughts about the pressure that was on you within, even within living in England, to actually have to go to London to the bright lights to cut it, to make it, to get mm -hmm. the deals and so on. Well, like we were in Liverpool at the time when we started, about '99, and uh, we just released things ourselves. So, and that was uh, picked up by, I think, um, like Steve Lamack and things mm -hmm. like that. John Peel played our record, um, and um, from there, obviously, that created a bit of a buzz, a lot of hype, and we didn't really want to succumb to the hype, and also we didn't feel like we should go to London, we wanted London to come to us. So what we did was we didn't play in London for quite some time, maybe even a year, and we were we were getting quite a lot of press at the time. Um, so we went to Paris, we did gigs, we did gigs in Paris, we did uh, Berlin, we did uh, Madrid and Barcelona. And it was only like way later that we actually went down to London. We wanted the press to come to us in Liverpool. And that's, did they? Yes, they did, yeah. But there was a lot of pressure and obviously the labels are down there, um, mm -hmm. and back then, you know, there was no internet, there was no Twitter, uh, Facebook, whatever, so uh, the pressure was on for people to have to do it that way, I think. I remember doing a, a documentary for the BBC, BBC Scotland, I think it was The Late Show about the Transmission Gallery, the art gallery, mm -hmm. about the uh, late 90s, and Scottish artists, visual artists, were just taking themselves across Europe willy-nilly I mean they weren't waiting for permission they were cutting their own deals they were getting their own fundings you know yeah. so there's that I mean I think there's that interesting I mean London is one place the obvious place to go but there is there's always been this kind of European route yes. for Scottish artists to go of whatever mm -hmm. medium or whatever genre that it is you know mm -hmm. and and do you think do you think what do you think will change could change post indie for artists here musical artists obviously there's all the Canadian models and all the kind of quotas and all the rest of it but have you any ideas? Have you any hopes and aspirations? Or now that you're here? Well, I mean, I hope that there isn't that draw for, for people to leave. Mm. So obviously there needs to be something set up here that encourages people to stay. Um, and I just think, I see it as a great opportunity independence. Um, and I would hope that 
there would be investment within because it's so interesting, a new country. Um, so something like that would need to happen. But also your first guest from Yes Digital was talking about crowd crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. I actually released a solo album last year um, and I crowdfunded it. Mm -hmm. um, and I did raise my goal and beyond my goal, mm -hmm. but then I was fortunate to, enough to have the backing, well, the back, Lady, Lady Tron background. Yeah. Um, and all I think that crowdfunding it, it, it relies a lot on social media and how many people know you're out there. Because mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're starting uh, and you want to um, raise enough to record your album, mix it, um, that's quite a lot of money. And if uh, you don't have that following, that social media following, then so it, it's harder. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was very lucky, but I do think that... Um, it, it's becoming more widespread now, so more people are interested, more people are aware that that's mm -hmm. there, and so they are looking for things to back. Like, um, Do you remember the I mean, Ireland they had, I don't think they have it now, but a long period of time they had tax breaks mm -hmm. for musicians and writers and people with copyright. Is that something? Is that, I mean, just in terms of, rather than necessarily a grant, but just an enablement of something. Is that, I mean, we all, we're all looking at our books these days as artists, as it, I'm sure you well know, but it's yeah. just it's something like that, some, some possibility of that. Yeah, I mean, I think anything would be helpful. Um, but the creativity is there, it's just, yeah, it's yes, yeah. I mean, in Gla Glasgow's completely thriving just now, I think, and there's so much going on musically and in the art world, and yeah, we, we just need a little bit of help. But then it's an interesting question as to whether you need any help. I mean, that's always been the interesting debate I've heard. Is that um, it's it's Darwinian wise, it comes up from the bottom anyway. Yeah, you know, there's so. a point where you need help. Yes. Um, but I mean, most people they, they they have the creativity. They'll make their music, but then they need the the point where they can push it to the next level, and that's normally the bit that costs a lot of money. So mm. that's where when you're when it's needed. I think. And fifteen seconds to promote your product. If you have one to promote. Uh, oh yes, oh, I've, I'm actually writing new music at the minute, and I've just I'm going to release a single shortly, and it's very influenced by the whole independence debate. Well, will it be very shortly then, as in before the day? Yes, I'm hoping so. Yeah. Yes. Right. And that's where the conversation stops. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Well, we should all be looking out for that. I should say as well. Um, you reminded me when you were talking about reaching your target that one thing we forgot to mention with Stuart was that the Declaration for Independence um, has actually reached it. Its target. Um, it was looking for a million signatures. It got a million this morning. Um, that was launched by the proclaimers. So well done. But a big hand for our guest. Thank you, Helen Marley. Okay, we have to wrap up. Um, as we do at the end of each one of these uh, referendum shows, we thank fulsomely uh, the sponsor, Sa sponsor, Sandy Adam. Thank you very much, Sandy. Uh, let me just say, uh, Sunday's guest, because the next show is on Sunday, it's not tomorrow, it's Sunday, which, who will include uh, journalist Angus Roxborough, uh, Derek Bateman, genuflect, uh, Chris Law of the Blue Goddess, cartoonist Greg Moody. I want to see what that guy looks like in reality rather than just in Photoshop. Um, and Lizzie Smith, who's going to be talking about something set up in Glasgow City Centre called the Referendum Cafe. This is it. This is my last participation in this brilliant programme. I think it anticipates how vibey, uh, maybe not quite as polished as, it, as, as we would all want programmes to be, but the vibe and the energy, this is what it's going to be like post-independence, full of fabulous people teeming with ideas and spluttering with passion. That's Isn't it, it Leslie? <laughs> and that's, just, that's uh, the end for me too. There is one more programme on Sunday, uh, so catch that. That's Ian McQuarter and Stephen Payton who will be presenting then. But from the two of us, the old buddies on the sofa, thank you very much. You've been joining Referendum TV. Bye-bye. <laughs>